Welcome back to the Space Alvi Institute podcast. I'm Andrew Pettiprin with Bobby Mixa. Bobby, how are you? I'm good, Andrew. How's Texas? It's good. It's warm today, thankfully. It doesn't feel very wintry, which is just the way I like it. How is it across uh, across over there well, in Poland? Well, it's warm here, but it's I, warm is like 30, 33 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, yeah. it's, uh, it's warm, beautiful, it was especially foggy this morning. So um, took a a uh, few pictures of Bobble like I always do and post those up online. So, so yeah. Excellent. Well, we know your photographs of Poland are kind of the envy of, of North Americans pining for the old world. So oh, we'll wow. be sure to check those out. Well, we're excited because we have a great guest today, Jennifer Newsom martin uh, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Theology at Notre Dame. And uh, breaking news, the newly appointed director of the, let me get it right, the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture. So we'll be excited to hear hear about that. Uh, Jennifer, welcome to the Space Alvi podcast. How are you? Thank you for having me. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. It is uh, also cold here in South Bend for the record. <laughs> there, I, I try to tell people there are there are warmer places to live, but I suppose, <laughs> you know, we can't, we can't help it. I, I heard, by the way, just as an aside, that Talking about the weather is one of the one of the least appealing things people want to listen to in a podcast. But oh well, you know that's all right. We're we're not your typical podcast. Um, we're 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 a niche, but we're hoping to expand the niche a little more. So so here it goes. Maybe we can today. Well, uh, Jennifer, we're we're really eager to talk to you because you're not only a, a Balthazar scholar, and we were kind of uh, joking before we started recording that we're our, this <laughs> this Space Alvi Institute podcast is becoming something of a Balthazar scholar. Clearing House. Um, but we're excited to talk to you today about Charles Piggy, who, uh, among other things, perhaps, but Charles Piggy, the French uh, poet and philosopher, uh, in our little venture here at the Space Alvi Institute, we've kind of attached ourselves to Charles Piggy as as kind of a, I don't know, kind of a patron, Bobby, would we say? Yeah, yeah. So many, so many ways. It just all things just come back to something Charles Piggy said best. Yeah, well, and I'm I I am really delighted to kind of explore Piggy because although I was a French major in college and even have a master's degree in European literature, I had never read any Piggy until recently, and some of that is of course on me, but some of it is just you know the the curricula that I was prescribed. Just you know, we read a lot of kind of depressing twentieth century stuff, not hopeful stuff, um, as it were, but. Um, Jennifer, maybe to get us started, just uh, for those who aren't really that familiar with Peggy, give us a sense of who he is and, and what his work is. Absolutely. Um, so I actually came to Peggy through Baltazar. Uh, he's got uh, Peggy as the sort of 12th style of theological aesthetics, the 12th and the um, the kind of culmination of what it is to sort of circle around the glory of God. Uh, and he says that Peggy, of all of the people that he talked about, was able to marry aesthetics and ethics um, better than anyone. And so um, that kind of uh, made me curious. And um, my friend uh, DC Schindler had translated a portal of the mystery of hope when he was at Casa Baltazar in Rome, um, I think in 96, maybe nine, a little bit later. But um, so I read that and I just fell head over heels. I think it was, uh, there was something about the, um, the ascesis of reading a poem that makes you slow down because there are all, of course, these deliberate repetitions and these images that are very um, humble, sort of agricultural images as a sort of North Carolina farm girl. You know, I, I appreciated all of that. And uh, I I thought that on the face of it, um, you know, if you describe it to someone, oh, it's a long narrative poem about um, the second theological virtue about the virtue of hope and it's sort of about children it sounds like it would be truly awful like saccharine and it's just like it, but it, I read it and I was just like how does he manage to get at this sort of heartbreaking kind of difficult um, I mean he, he says that hope is the thing that leaves teeth marks like bite marks on your heart um, and so I just really I got very interested in in Peggy so um, the, the more I, that was my first introduction and so then I just kind of read around. I learned a little bit more about his life. Um, he grew up very poor. He worked with his um, his mother uh, caning chairs in Orleum. And uh, he was um, 
always like he's sort of a contradict a, con- a figure who of, of contradiction i mean there are people who say he's progressive he's conservative he's catholic he's socialist he's this he's that he's a mystic he's interested in politics but somehow he manages to be all of those things at one time um he manages also to uh i recently gave a paper at um a french spiritualist conference in boston um where we were talking about kind of um Peggy and sacrifice and uh, as an inheritor of maybe some of the French spiritualist lines of thinking. And uh, we, were, we were talking about how um, how funny it is that he he is always good for literalizing metaphor, right? Because he's talking about this kind of notion of sacrifice. And then he, of course, died very young in World War I, shouting in the front lines on the eve of the Battle of Marne, for God's sake, push ahead, right? I mean, so he's just like uh, always kind of... Um, He's such an interesting figure politically and in terms of like French Catholicism, but also in terms of his prose writings and his um, his poetry as well. I could speak a little bit more about some of the other poetry if, if you'd like or some of the prose things, uh, whatever you'd like. Yeah, please do. Okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so, so Portal of the Mystery of Hope, um, as I'm sure your listeners um, may already know, is a kind of center triptych of this long narrative poem. And it's a conversation, it's kind of nested in this longer conversation between Joan of Arc and a young nun, Madame Gervais. And so we have the the first one of those is the um the the mystery of the charity of Joan of Arc, then the portal of the mystery of hope, and then uh the the mystery of the holy innocence, which tells the story of um of the children that Herod sacrificed and um at Jesus' birth. And they're also lovely. Um and then uh, those of you who are kind of interested in maybe more French philosophy or Henri Bergson or, or folks like that, uh, there's a very interesting text that just got translated in 2019 that people may be interested in, uh, which is the last two texts that Peg- Peggy wrote, one of which is posthumous, um, Notes on Bergson and Notes on Descartes. Um, and that's more prose work. Ostensibly, it has to do with Descartes, but there's actually um, both of them kind of are serving as apologia for Henri Bergson and the way that he approaches the philosophical tasks, sort of allowing the lyrical and the intuitive uh, and different kinds of um, of thinking in. Um, it's a very interesting text. There's a lot of Marian, um, a lot of Marian imagery in there as well. So yeah, he's a he's a fascinating figure. Yeah. Did he have much of a correspondence with uh, Bergson? Yes, um, he was one of his sort of great defenders, and um, you know. Berg, uh, Bergson um, was also well known by uh, Jacques and Raisa Maritain, mm-hmm. who went to his lectures and loved them. Um, and then you know, a lot of people, the Maritains and also Peggy, eventually sort of felt that some of his later work was a bit more controversial. Bergson's um, the the book Creative Evolution was a little bit much for um, for most of the people who liked him. And at that point, uh, Jacques Maritain wrote a book kind of denouncing um, mm-hmm. some of Bergson's ideas. Um, and then even even Peggy, you know, who's called, you know, Bergson's most loyal disciple, said he thought that maybe it was a bit um, overstated and things like that. So, yes, uh, there's a very interesting kind of uh, connections there, uh, for sure. I mean, one of the, um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. No, 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 go ahead, please. Um, I was just going to say one of the things that I really like about um, Peggy and Bergson together, uh, this is a a piece I I wrote for Communio a few years ago, but um, the thing that I thought was very interesting about what Peggy takes from Bergson is the notion of precarity. He says that um, precarity is the only situation that is Christian, right? So if we if we try to save, if we try to protect ourselves, if if we don't kind of live in this kind of um, existence of vulnerability and and risk um he says that that peggy in, uh, that bergson introduces into the modern age uh, a sense of precarity uh, and sort of openness to harm uh, which i find a very inter- interesting kind of idea because it's certainly not um, a value that a lot of us are interested in um, introducing into our own lives, right we kind of want the opposite yeah, I, I, I say more about that I, if you could. I, you maybe you've already said a lot, but I'm that's intriguing. Precarity, yeah. Yes. Um, so, so basically, um, Peggy is is sort of offering a lot of um, very sort of trenchant critiques of kind of the modern condition. He says that that modernity uh, has turned everything into commodity. It's turned everything into money, right? It's ossified and made rigid everything which should be supple and organic, right? So, uh, and and to 
sort of capitulate, Peggy says, to the regime of money is to divide up all of reality in ways that can be bought and sold, even the things which resist being bought and sold. And so that's what um, I think that's the context in which he was uh, he was speaking about this um, this notion of uh, what it is to cast yourself upon you know, the providence of God or the goodness of other people. And of course, he's sort of burned by um, the Dreyfus affair, which you had uh, a, a Jewish captain falsely accused of espionage and then sort of scapegoated. Uh, Peggy was very, um, he took that to heart. It, it became sort of his cause. Um, but I, yeah, I think this this idea that um, that God himself allows for systems of mediation, right? God doesn't just sort of like immediately say, here I am, here's all the truth you need to know, but, you know, puts, a, a, it's an organic kind of thing that that takes time to um, to evolve, right? I mean, it's uh, the, over the course of a pregnancy and a birth, um, this sort of quiet, more um, sort of dynamic way of bringing God to, Earth. I mean, so it's 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 very interesting, right? It's not the machine; it's the human being. It's Mary's sort of fiat. It's Mary's yes, um, and she might as she could have said no, right? I mean, there's freedom there. So just even God um, is subject for Peggy to the processes freely, subject to the processes of of mediation. Um, so it's it's really kind of a beautiful idea, I think. Yeah, but I want to I want to go. I, I want to talk about the flesh in a minute, but Bobby, do you want to carry on with the money part? Because I know well, you really, that's something you want yeah. to talk about. Um, yeah, Jenny, I, 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 um, it was funny because I asked you about Peggy and I, I remember like reading something uh, that you wrote about Peggy for Kamuni, which you just mentioned years ago. Um, and so uh, I had a little bit of time uh, actually a little earlier today and I, I was going through the article and I found, I just highlighted everything that you just mentioned about the uh, the money and um, his writings on modernity um, and 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 looking to Mary is what I, I especially underlined. So I mean, there was just so many lines here. I just want to just read one of them, which it says his appeal to Mary is especially apropos insofar as Peggy links the glorious insecurity of the present with images of growth, seeds, reproduction, fertility, and fecundity as signs of contradiction against the barrenness and sterility of the deterministic, mechanistic, materialistic, and capitalistic impulses of the modern world. And, you know, if anybody is interested in that, um, it's near the end of your, your great um, essay on Peggy. And then he gets into the money part. And it seems here, I, gotta, I think I underlined this, that associating, he associates um, money um, with the Antichrist and against all forms of spirituality. Could you maybe say just a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, he's a, he's absolutely a radical, right, about this. Um, you know, I'd, you know, I've got a retirement fund. Right? So, I mean, it's not <laughs> like I'm really, um, you know, like really bought into all of this. I think it's really interesting, though, um, because, I mean, what it seems like he, I mean, it may not be money as such, but I think it is like, Peggy is just like nervous about this um, this sort of ersatz metaphysical status that money has taken, right? I mean, we are sort of like elevating it as if it is this sort of thing when it, in fact, it is paper and um, it is, we, we, we sort of render it these, we give it the symbol um, or this meaning. Um, but I, I think he says that, you know, it, it's, he's worried that like, if, if we all buy into to this idea that it's money is the thing that we need. So when we think about um, what is it to lay aside uh, for the future, we're not really laying aside for this kind of profound eschatological future. I mean, so although this is Bergson too, right? This notion of like, we're all sort of oriented to this um, futurity and that's always new, all the images in Peggy about the, um, the ever uh, new, ever youthful, ever flowing spring, which turns bad water into good right so that's that's the kind of like connection with with the supernatural that is like god is this source but we we say well, we're, we're saving for the future we mean we're saving for our retirement it's a completely immunitized kind of idea so it just sort of shutters any possibility that there are values beyond 
kind of personal financial or physical security, right? So I think that's what he means. I mean, he's uh, he's always um, speaking in hyperbole. I think um, money is, you know, if the Antichrist. I mean, um, I mean, my kids need braces, right? I mean, it's not like uh, yeah, so yeah. it's. it's yeah, it's so I, I just I just kind of think it's it's interesting because he says um, in another place in the in the notes he says we've taken everything uh, reality itself all of this kind of like transcendent mysterious um, sort of divine presence in the world but we've made it everything into a commodified product right and so he's so interested in um, he's so interested in repetition and he's a, such, he performs repetition poetically um, and it becomes a kind of um, symbol or like a, a way of thinking even about the way about tradition right that we're, we're doing these sort of things we're doing old things newly or we're not just kind of repeating the same thing but he's saying the the repetitions of of the modern machine are are just kind of like you know you make them to sell them he, you know that he's got all these wonderful lines you know that um he says the ancients are like the linen on which paper is made and the moderns are like sort of old ink on newspaper, right? He says, Homer is new every morning and nothing is as old as today's newspaper, right? So there's something in which we've, we've kind of constricted the possibility of like, of living, um, living into this sort of supernatural reality um, by accepting that we're already so exhausted, right? We've, we sort of made ourselves exhausted by, um, by refusing the connection to the real futurity which is going to give real life and real security, uh, even though it doesn't look that way imminently. So I think that's what he means. But um, but I mean, he's much more of a radical than I am, I think. Yeah, he is very radical. Let me let me test this idea, Jenny, that it seems to me that there's kind of a confusion in modernity or postmodernity or whatever we're in among people who really want to be pious, like who really want to take the faith seriously, that they they kind of forget that money, like the, so they'll sort of say, okay, we need to detach. Um, but then they'll sort of forget that money is kind of, as you say, kind of like not real. Um, and so, but then there's a kind of reluctance to attach to the real. You know, and and that when I read Peggy, it's just like it's about the land of France, and it's about like children, and it's about it's about like real stuff, and that stuff we really ought to attach to. You know, um, why? Because and maybe you can say more about this because of the incarnation, because of the resurrection, because we are bodies. You know, we are bodies and souls, right? I mean, that to me is a message that really needs to be heard, and like kind of, and there are people doing it and kind of bringing that back. Obviously, the theologians that you know, that liked Peggy, um, uh, picked that up, but, um, I don't know, maybe just take that and run with it. Just kind of the whole kind of body thing and flesh thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I was reminded as you were talking of, uh, I'm a big fan of, of DC Schindler's work, as I've already mentioned, um, and that he's got, um, a book, what's it called? Um, something like love in the postmodern predicament or love beauty in the postmodern predicament, something like that. Um, where he's got an essay in there that he says that, um, we need beauty because beauty puts us back in touch with the real, right? I mean, it's a very, maybe a counterintuitive idea. We tend to think, or maybe the um, the broader culture tends to think of beauty as something that's abstract or something that's ephemeral. Uh, but he's like, no, that is where you have contact with the real. And I think that's, that's super interesting. But I mean, anybody who reads Peggy for more than 10 minutes will certainly see how, um, how flesh um, and, and bodies themselves are, are just at the very center of his spirituality, right? He never, makes the false binary that it's the spiritual or the bodily. It's uh, it's always this extraordinarily, I mean, he even uses, he uses the words of flesh. He uses the words of carnality, like meat, right? I mean, he's really, he's really interested in, um, in kind of like in matter and materiality. And for sure, I think that's governed by, um, by the incarnation for him. Um, and also it, it comes out, I think in his, his patriotism, which you already mentioned. Um, I mean, so, you know, and then he's got these kind of long excursies in his poetry about um, French gardens and the French soil. And like, so it's, it's very much, like, this is his place. And um, it's the particularity of place, which he's so, um, so committed to. Um, but I mean, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, so he'll say things like in Portal of the Mystery of Hope, kind of famously, we'll say things about, um, 
you know, the angels just don't know. The angels don't know, but we know because we have a body. We have a body like the child Jesus, right? I mean, it's a gorgeous set of lines that, and so it's, it's sort of reversed, right? So it, the angels, instead of being kind of like, um, you know, a higher form, uh, it's actually the human beings who have the the privilege because they sort of exist in this, again, sort of precarious embodied existence and are subject to harm, um, subject to wounds, subject to illness, subject to aging, all those things, those don't become, um, they don't become barriers to him. I mean, he's got all these, um, on the question of aging, um, he's got all these really interesting things to say about, um, you know, we sort of exist in this premature old age. We've kind of capitulated to our own villessement, you know, our own aging. Um, but in truth, um, to be connected with the spring um, of living water, this sort of sap is um, is always to be kind of to participate with um, with the childhood of Christ. I mean, it, there's, some, there's some really lovely ideas, but um, but he'll say things like, um, you know, that Mary is holy not in spite of, but because of her carnality, right? I mean, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly very elevated. And of course, this is one of the reasons that Baltasar liked him so much too, because it's not only very sort of Christological, but it's also um, very sacramental. And this notion of uh, of form being able to mediate sort of splendor is certainly there in, in Peggy, um, I think, in a very beautiful ways. Um, he never lets us forget um you know, that we are bodies. He's got these long, or, you know, these essays in his, uh, in the cahier about, you know, like what it's like to have the flu. He's actually got, I think, two essays on, um, on the flu, <laughs> which, uh, you know, it's just uh, really interesting to, to think about, like, I think that's kind of part of the communio school too, um, that everything is uh, open to a Catholic kind of reading. I mean, like the whole, the whole embodied existence is um which is so interesting that's why Camino can have essays on you know food or money or things like that right because it's all fair game um we're not yeah. kind of displacing our human existence beyond uh to some kind of it, it it's it's real right so yeah, yeah great question you know when yeah, i first I'm... go ahead yeah. no 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 like when i first started reading um piggy uh it's at john paul ii institute and Actually, uh, I, at the time, I did not do, know that D.C. Schindler. I didn't look at who translated this work, um, but that he was actually uh, he was uh, he wasn't teaching that class on Piggy, but um, I was I had him as a teacher at that time. But it was around the same time I also saw a movie called The Tree of Life by Terrence Malick. And I remember during that one of the seminars on the book, I I mentioned the movie uh, in class and. I was surprised because uh, the teacher never heard of Terrence Malick, and it seemed like nobody in the room even knew about this movie. So clearly, um, Terrence Malick, I don't think, was making the film for uh, making a buck. I don't think he makes any of his movies for that sake. But I, it, what really struck me was that just, um, like you said earlier, this kind of repetition, but then focus um, of bringing somewhat like time and eternity together, um, bringing flesh and spirit all together. Um, everything seemed to, in, uh, this kind of pouring out. I remember some people saying that it's almost like maybe he's viewing matter as as evil, like a degradation. But it seemed to me that, it, it, and maybe possibly you could read it that way, but it seemed like almost as if everything's being poured out to become incarnate in some way. And at the end of that movie, I remember with the eschatological imagery of like the new heavens, new earth, the the bride groom and the bride and and all of that. I just kept thinking about Peggy. And I, anyways, I just uh, I wanted to bring that up because I know I think you have written about the tree of life before. And if there's anything kind of like with the Charles Peggy's sensibility um, in mm. at least that film and his Malik's imagination. Oh, that's lovely. I I mean, of course, I don't know if Malik himself has read Piggy. I mean, he's very influenced. I mean, he's incredibly, he's my very favorite filmmaker. Um, and I do love that movie. I mean, I think um, I, 
I think some people may find it t tedious in the same way that people might find Peggy tedious, right? Because it's like, it is uh, sort of slow. It does kind of make you slow down and get this new mode of attention um, sort of to get to, to watch the movie. I mean, I, I show it sometimes to my students at Notre Dame when we read the book of Job, right? We read Job and then maybe some other commentaries on Job. And then we watch Tree of Life as a commentary on the book of Job. Um, but I think um, the students who are open to it, um, I think really sort of see that. And to me, I, 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 your interpretation seems exactly right to me. I mean, of course there's that um, gorgeous, is it like 19 minute creation scene, right? Where everything sort of slows down and it goes to like, you see cells dividing and you see, you know, um, various uh, kind of cosmic rumblings. Um, and uh, and then then it cuts to that scene of, um, of Brad Pitt holding his baby's foot, right? I mean, so it's like, it's like, it's, it's from the cosmic, to this, like, to this teeny baby, um, to children playing, it, even the sort of um, the not entirely innocent kind of um, behavior of the of the boys. I mean, it gets boys exactly right. I've got two boys, but it's like uh, there's something uh, that really sacralizes all of this um, this human experience, um, and I think right, it pours out into into flesh. I mean, I'm thinking of, you mentioned this sort of obliquely, uh, Bobby, of um, where Jessica Chastain's character is saying, you know, I, I, I return him to you and there's hands and you have the, uh, the sort of midwife hand underneath, right? I mean, it's this sort of like older hand and it just like, it does, it just really highlights this idea of, um, of flesh and kind of like the way that human experience um, if it's attuned to all of this kind of mystery, I mean, and even suffering itself gets kind of folded in to the mystery, right? I mean, that's why I think it's such an interesting commentary on Job. I mean, of course, I think Malik meant it to be with the, the beginning where he's got the, the line from Job, but um, that creation itself, uh, we sort of uh, have to acknowledge the mystery and profundity of our own suffering and the suffering of our neighbors. But I think that movie situates it in sort of a broader notion of suffering, which is why I think, um, what is it? The lacrimosa song that plays during creation. I mean, it's like, it's this sort of haunting, sad, um, kind of like desperately sad song soundtrack to creation. But, and so then it sort of enfolds this family's, moment of suffering into this sort of greater envelope of sacrificial love. I mean, it's a very sort of beautiful kind of way that it does that. Um, and I think, yeah, Peggy certainly would have had, you know, the notion of, of sacrifice kind of at the heart uh, of things um, and these participations in sacrifice. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting link. I would uh, now I'm excited like to watch the movie again. <laughs> so. I think uh, not, not to just talk about Malik, but I think a hidden life does something similar. I mean, the, you know, just kind of like the the sense of the land and like the, I mean, it begins with them like digging potatoes, and but mm -hmm. ultimately it's like about this sacrifice. You know, this sort of yes or no to Christ, yes or no to reality, um, which I think is is consonant with Piggy. Um, I would, you know, let's talk a little more about Piggy's faith because you know he. Maybe you could actually just clarify for me. It's not entirely clear to me, like where. So he, I, my understanding is his wife was not Catholic, and he, and he spent a long time like trying to figure out like whether to fully, like how he could really be in the church. And so I, I don't know. Maybe say something to us about that. I, I well, I, I'll just say one more thing. My confusion is rooted in kind of an admiration, actually. I mean, I, I mean, I just think like clearly this is somebody who like who wants reality who and who is sort of who sees the church as proposing that and is also mm -hmm. like really trying to figure out what it takes to fully be in it and and not to want it cheaply you know to really want it for real yeah 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 absolutely um i mean um you're absolutely right i mean i think uh it's a very complicated i think peggy had a very complicated relationship with institutional catholicism um for much of his life um and then i think the dreyfus affair only exacerbated that i mean so he was he was a socialist for a while and then he said that's not radical enough and then sort of became reacquainted with the catholicism of his youth uh but 
you know, in the Dreyfus affair, the, ch the church was kind of um, anti-Dreyfus and he did not like that. And so there are uh, there are ways in which he thinks, you know, that the institutional church had sort of um, capitulated to uh, kind of the wrong side, the side of the machine, <laughs> the man. Um, and uh, and then he's got these, you know, a lot of lines um, of, of criticism. Uh, in some of his um, his other prose works where he's very critical of the hierarchy, he's critical of clergy in general. Um, he talks about, you know, some clergy, um, His one of his worst kind of insults is to call someone a bureaucrat, right? So he's like, mm -hmm. you know, we're sort of like buying into the bureaucratic kind of like modern boring thing, you know, and he's, he doesn't want that. But he still has this very live um, connection to and longing for the sacraments. Um, but again, it's complicated as well because his wife was not Catholic and um, didn't want their children to be baptized. And that was a great sort of source of personal um, hurt, I think, for Piggy that uh, the children, you know, that she didn't want them to be baptized. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think he, he reconnected with Catholicism kind of later in his life, but it was always um, complicated, I think, by, um, by his feelings about institutional religion, right? Which is, you know, it's, it's interesting. I mean, there may be some parallels with, um, rough parallels with Bergson, right? So a lot of people say like, oh, Bergson wanted to be Catholic, but ultimately um, made the sacrifice, they interpret it this way, that he sacrificed that um, out of solidarity for his fellow um, Jewish brothers and sisters, right? I mean, it's a beautiful thing. So um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, I think it was a source of no small turmoil uh, for Peggy. Um, but I mean, he certainly counted himself as a Catholic um, and found a lot of resonance with Catholicism, even if all of its expressions he didn't agree with. Yeah. If I could just add one more thing before throwing it back to you, Bobby. I mean, I I don't know. For I, I sometimes get frustrated when I hear, you know, w whether it's the, you know, the 20 years of dealing with the abuse scandals or like whatever it may be in the Catholic Church, that there's there's a tendency to just kind of want to say, well, yes, you know, but or whatever. Whereas I see in Peggy somebody who like is a really inspiring figure, frankly, about somebody who believes in the truth claims of the Catholic Church and also is willing to just, I don't know. I mean, I think maybe more of us should just kind of acknowledge the you know, the kind of the complexity rather than, you know, rather than just kind of feel like, well, I guess I just shouldn't worry about that or whatever. I don't know. I, for me personally, maybe it's because I'm, I don't know, a little bit of a contrarian. I, I find, I find that kind of inspiring about Piggy. Yeah. He's, I mean, he's absolutely, the, the, the radicality I think is, uh, is what's always kind of, he's a bit subversive and I find that really interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, when, I, I, I like I'm all for that. And but then I think like when I when I teach like a, a sort of a basic ecclesiology course and people are like, oh, the church is such a mess, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, um, I think I think Peggy would have um been sympathetic to the sort of distinction between, okay, you have sort of, you know, this imminent sort of church here as this pilgrim church on earth, and then the sort of mystical reality of the bride of Christ, you know, um, which is marked by, of course, uh, oneness and holiness and, you know, being apostolic and all of this. So, um, so yeah, I think he was attuned to the sort of like hidden richness um, and possibility uh, without being um, a Pollyanna about how things kind of cash out in history and, and time. You know? mm -hmm. But no, I think you're right. I mean, I think, uh, I think he's a, I mean, he, he's very interesting in about the idea of revolution in any way, right? I mean, so he'll talk about revolution um, in a lot of places, but um, most famously, he talks about, uh, okay, so a revolution is not upending what we've done uh, in the past. A, a revolution is to return to a more ancient uh, source, right? So we, we must sort of revolve and go back to this more ancient source, which will vivify us to... Um, to sort of revolt, right? So it's not that he's just throwing everything off. It's a very interesting idea. I mean, he's the one who coined the term uh, ressourcement, actually, about going back to the source. And he does that in the context of talking about the sort of orbital notion of revolution, going back to a deeper, more ancient source. So yeah, it, it's, it's very interesting because he's not just like, he's, I, I think it's right. He's neither conservative nor progressive. He's a revolutionary and he's radical um, with all the complexity that that entails.
Yeah. I remember uh, D.L. Schindler always said being radical means, you know, radix. It's going to the roots yes. of Going things. to the roots, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, I just wanted to ask you there, too, like uh, about the I did not know that he actually coined the term race or small. Um, but thinking about I know, you know, Balthazar in Lay Styles has that big section on Pegui. But um, were there other French, like, say, the Lubac, um, um, or even Jean Daniel Lou, were they also looking to Begui as well? Yeah, I think so, for sure. I mean, even um, Congar's uh, True and False Reform in the Church, um, it talks about Peggy, uh, I think, at the beginning of that text. And he also, I think, talks about Claudel, another kind of French poet who's, who's we could also talk about, super interesting. Um, but yeah, I think um, I think Henri de Lubac, um, certainly uh, read him and liked him and has written about him. Um, and uh, Don Elu, I don't know for sure, um, but I know De Lubac and Kangar uh, certainly were very animated by this notion of um, kind of inbreaking uh, eternity in in the sort of finite moment, right? So, the, the, so that way we can talk about, like De Lubac says in, uh, is it Paradoxes? Maybe it's somewhere else where he says, we are... Uh, you know, that Origen and Augustine are our brothers, they're our contemporaries, because we are all sort of through time and history, they're not just kind of old dusty figures from the past, but they're standing kind of shoulder to shoulder with us, because we're all sort of, um, sort of adoring the one Christ, right? I mean, so that there's this sort of idea of time, this sort of recursive new idea of time that I think Peggy and Bergson think about, which, if not kind of explicitly, maybe in the air, these figures who sort of reconfigure time and history to talk about going back to the sort of more ancient source to, to be a, a genuine source of a liveliness and um, in a real contact with, with divine presence. Um, I think that's definitely some, I mean, and of course, like, I mean, Balthasar has um, not only that big section in um, glory of the Lord, but he also in his preface or forward to his book on Gregory of Nyssa, he actually quotes, from Peggy's notes on Bergson and Descartes, um, like quite a bit. Uh, so he's obviously read um, a lot more than just the poetry. Yeah. Oh, no, fascinating. Um, can I can I just add one one thing? Um, I just I have to talk about Krakow for a second here. But um, you know, we talk a lot about like the, the Andrew the, the marks of the faith still present here, even in the land and architecture of of Europe, but. Um, you know, every day I walk past Vavil and a bunch of other cathedrals, but, uh, and not, sorry, one cathedral, many other churches, but the, um, you oftentimes see here like eight, like the number eight, okay, like, um, you know, at the, on the top, meeting like the, the cube um, underneath. And so this kind of, you're always reminded of this bringing together of time and eternity or heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it's just all over the land here. Uh, and I never really, I, I, I was reading also your, your book here on, um, on Balthazar and the critical appropriation of Russian religious thought. I mean, a really good, good book, and especially the section on eschatology at the end here. But I'm sure like many, many Catholics just don't really even think about that um, with partaking in, in the liturgy that your your eternity is coming to you, and you're meeting the time is meeting eternity. It's transforming all things. I know you have David Fagerberg. I think he's retired now at yes. uh, Notre Dame. But reading his work just really, really helped me, uh, helped me kind of appreciate that. Um, but you mentioned too, of like kind of going back to the root um, of things, and it seems that like Pegui, you said. Uh, getting at this, the root is almost as it's trini trinitarian love. Um, that is the eternity pouring itself out and partaking in that. It just seems it's it's all over the land, and we just need more, I guess, tour guides here in Krakow who can perhaps maybe I'm seeing things, but perhaps maybe bring that to light so that uh, people may may appreciate what uh, our forebears uh, gave us. Sounds like you're volunteering for a job. I <laughs> guess. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. I mean, I love the idea. I mean, of course, I'm so struck by um, what you said about the architecture and the, uh, you know, because it, that made me think immediately of, um, 
you know, the of Revelation at the end of Revelation, where we have this sort of all of these sort of instructions for um, for building like these particular dimensions and all of these kinds of things, uh, right? Where it's like you have this sort of collapsing of of time and eternity. Um, but we tend, I think, a lot of people sort of in a popular sense tend to think that is something that is only eschatologically deferred, you know, and that's something. But and then you sort of go into church and think like, oh, here I'm doing this thing. But yeah, I mean, there's so much in our shared theological tradition about, you know, participating in the liturgy. I mean, the um, pseudo Dionysus, when he talks about, you know, the ecclesiastical hierarchies and the celestial hierarchies and all of these kind of ways in which um, he, he even has this uh, beautiful section in um, ecclesiastical hierarchy about the chrism, the smell of chrism, um, which is just an exquisite smell, of course. I've had three children baptized and two of three confirmed. Um, and, uh, he says that, you know, when we sort of inhale the the chrism, we are inhaling the fragrance of Jesus and that inhaling the fragrance of Jesus, we must sort of accord ourselves um, to the beauty of Christ. And, and typically those things are, are like visual, um, but this is like one of the few examples I can think of that's olfactory, right? It's like mm -hmm. this sort of very sort of physical, um, sens sensorial kind of moment um, is also at the same time, a kind of like according of ourselves with to make ourselves as fragrant as the fragrant Christ. I mean, it's a beautiful idea. Um, but yeah, it's like, I think it's like what, um, I mean, to take it back to Tree of Life, what Brad Pitt's character says, right? You know, there was glory shining all around me and I, I dishonored the glory. He didn't have the eyes to see until um, sort of the veil was rent and then, uh, and then he could see it everywhere. It's a very Dostoevsky moment, right? It's like everything is shining all the time with the glory of God. Um, but we often uh, have these blinders on and we think that um, that's the, the really real, we're always mistaken about what's the really real. Yeah. We think money is yeah. really real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. It's weird. I mean, you know, lately people have been saying, you know, the, the whole, um, the whole idea that we, we used to live in an enchanted universe and then we became disenchanted. And now people are saying, well, it's not, we're, it's not that we're disenchanted, we're misenchanted, right? Like we're always, we're always sort of living in some false glory or something, you know? And so when we start talking like this, it, you know, people who just kind of aren't plugged in might think, oh, now, now this is getting weird. Like this is all just this mystical thing or like whatever. But, but I really think like, if you just, if you learn to kind of reset you you really can experience this this as the real and i think very much including our fellow catholics i mean we don't mass is not about going and popping a grace pill i say this all the time you know it's it is this reality of it is this you know um experience of of what will be and that's something that i think is in peggy very strongly you know um we named our little venture Sp uh, space salvi after uh, pope benedict's um, encyclical, and also, and not just because we love Pope Benedict, but because we we're really interested in eschatology and think that like that's that helps us live now. Um, like really, that's that's the whole idea of hope. Um, and um, it, I don't know where I'm going with this, except except to maybe come back around to the flesh thing uh, with with Peggy and um, and his sort of um, this connection with the land and and life now as the foretaste of of what will be not some like disconnected thing not some like you know die and float away into the clouds kind of thing mm -hmm. um which it's really wonderful that this is being conveyed to us in this like mystical poetry you know it's like it's kind of kind of oxymoronic or something but it's 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 exactly right once you kind of get into it no absolutely i mean um I'm a sort of like amateur gardener and uh, I've been so um, I've been having a sort of mystical experience with seeds. Lately, mm -hmm. Basically I've just like, I've been doing a lot of like winter sowing um, and just like me pouring the seeds out into my hand and even looking to see what they look like. Like um, calendula seeds are just like these little sort of shrimp. They look like little crustaceans. And then like, you've got poppy seeds and there's like a thousand of them, like black pepper. And I just like thinking about um, the sort of, potency of these things that look like literal nothing i mean they look like you could blow up. i mean they're they look like nothing uh but then sort of um watching them i mean e even if i think if i wasn't a catholic i would be sort of blown away by this sort of like mystery of how that little thing um becomes a flower becomes i mean sort of like th that that to me it, it seems like um 
there's something really interesting there when you were talking about like the land, right? I mean, and and there's like the agricultural kind of um, metaphors, I think are more than metaphors for Peggy, right? I mean, because it's like, you can see um, something that looks like a nothing, um, but then has to like change its form. I mean, there's even that self-sacrificial kind of element there too, you know, it, it becomes something that it was not before. It becomes something one million times more wonderful, right? I mean, so yeah, I think there's there's something there. Um, of course, that's the the big metaphor of Brothers Karamazov too at the beginning. Unless this grain of wheat shall fall to the earth and die, right? I mean, um, I don't know. That's uh, it's kind of a a tangent, but um, but yeah, seeing the sort of mystery at the heart of things in the smallest things, I think that's that's what we have to learn how to do. <laughs> Uh, culturally, maybe. Yeah. But now with uh, Piggy dying um, in, in like the, with the beginning around the beginning of World War One, One yeah. um, mm -hmm. what would, did he have any kind of forecast for the the world in which we're, we're all living? I mean, especially for Europe, because so much of what we're 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 kind of here trying to to make the case and that you know so much depends upon upon faith in in Europe. Um, and like particularly what not to kind of get Eurocentric or, you know, right. like great degrade, but at least to see that this is kind of like the vine um, in so many respects that has been here for a long time. Uh, European culture has has existed here and there's st it's still in despite its secularism uh, in many respects still still here. Um, what was what was Pegui's uh, thoughts on Europe and where it was headed? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, he's, he o almost only ever talks about France, right? I mean, for him, um, France is kind of like, I mean, cause it's, like I said, it's, he, he was so, um, interested in France because it's his country, but he was also very interested in Joan of Arc kind of throughout his life, not just in the kind of long narrative poem, but for him, Joan of Arc is a kind of, um, model for sort of engagement, I guess this, um, who who was able to sort of bring together the the religious and the political? Um, so I don't. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, his his last book he didn't finish because he got up. He wrote half a sentence and then went to World War. He went to the battle and got shot in the head. Um, like for God's sake, push ahead. Saying that and then uh, so I, I'm trying to remember the last sentence. I think it's something like. Um, but the Protestants dot dot dot. <laughs> so you know, maybe maybe you could have had some uh, something interesting there. But um, but no, I, I you know I think um, I, I think Peggy he obviously as a sort of a, of a particular time and place. Um, I don't know that he would have um, loved a certain the sort of cosmopolitanism where it's sort of like everything is sort of like. I mean, it happens more in America, obviously, than in Europe, where every every city sort of looks the same. Um, like he he wanted to sort of maintain the sort of particularity and the difference um, and the identity of a particular place. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I think he would say that modern Europe has almost has given itself over entirely to um, all of the sort of uh, disasters of modernity that he decries in a lot of his work. I mean, I, I don't, maybe he would see these little, these little seeds, the, the sort of uh, existence of the, uh, the church is still, they sort of persist, the land persists, you know, the, um, the graves persist. There are all these kind of hidden testaments if people can see it, but, um, but I think he would want Europe to uh, return to a more ancient source, right? To go back and to sort of, that's where the sort of principle of revitalization might be um, to go back, but in a new way, right? Not in a sort of repetitive way. You can't, you know, repristinate the past, but you can, as a, a, a person living in the present, um, have a good memory, right? And not forget uh, all this sort of like, it's not just the sort of ideas, but it's like the land, it's the bones, it's the people, you know, it's all of that stuff is like, is there. And I think like with the potency of a seed, which could, I mean, with the right conditions, maybe fan some life, spiritual life into things. I think maybe you're seeing some of that already. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder if Peggy may be, uh, you know, it, it, I guess in the vein of T.S. Eliot, I mean, we're, we're, 
it's it's all kind of a lost cause in a way, but who cares? Um, but um, maybe Piggy really could be a, a figure for this revitalization uh, for European faith, which, as Bobby said, has just it just will. I can't imagine that it won't ever have a kind of effect on the rest of Christianity. I mean, just because you know Europe is where Peter and Paul went. I mean, you know, it's it just it's just the the spring really of. Um, of, of Christianity, but I was thinking about how, you know, um, Charles de Gaulle was an admirer of Peggy and de Gaulle, you know, among other kind of, I think Pope Benedict called that, that generation of statesmen, like the great hour of Christian statesmen or something like that. And, mm. you know, like, like Conrad Adenauer and, um, you know, various others who really, who, who kind of thought there could be like a baptized, but also secular, state uh, or, or set of states in Europe. And I, I think that's proving not to be, not to be true. Um, but uh, anyway, but, but the point I suppose is to say, yeah, like maybe um, despite certain misplaced hopes or misplaced optimism or something to not use the theological word from some people who, who admired Piggy, maybe a new generation will admire Piggy. And as you say, kind of in, get interested in more of that, radical or revolutionary way of thinking, which in a way isn't necessarily not conservative or not compatible with liberalism, maybe. We don't we don't know yet. I mean, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But I mean, I, I think about the way that um the way that sort of Chesterton talks about revolution and uh and T. S. Eliot and, and others like that. So I don't know if you feel that way that Peggy maybe is one of those that sort of needs to be kind of we need to promote him more for the sake maybe of of the future. I mean, of course, I would be all for that. I mean, Peggy is mm -hmm. uh, one of my very favorite poets, and I think like a real, um, a real student of of what like real hope actually looks like. I mean, so like it's again, he's not um, it's not a hope that doesn't cost him anything, right? I mean, there's a but he but he's a, I, I, I tell the story all the time. I just there's this little text that he wrote. Um, which I'm just really interested in called um, the secret of the man of 40, which is in an appendix. If you wanted to read the translation of the notes on Bergson and Descartes. And uh, it's really interesting because he's just like, you know, he says, there's a secret that everyone who is 40 knows and no one who is younger than 40 could ever hear. Right. This is a mm -hmm. secret that it's traded in uh, alleyways and, um, you know, under bridges and things like that. Um, and the secret is that, that no one is happy and no one has ever been happy. And only a 40 year old person can understand this, <laughs> you know, oh, uh, which is interesting. I know, but then he says, but then he says, but that man will look at his children and he will think to himself, this time it will be different, right? So despite all of the kind of evidence to the contrary, you look upon the face of your child and you think this time it will be different. And that's for him what hope is, right? It's mm -hmm. this idea that like, in the absence of evidence, um, in like the midst of disappointment, in the midst of like what looks like dryness or in the midst of what looks like, um, you know, utter secularity, you look at some seed and say, this time it will be different. I mean, to me, that's like, that's where Peggy um, is really important for any kind of revitalization effort. It's like, we do this all the time, right? We have these sort of like, the act of hope is is sort of a miracle, which is what, of course, Peggy's God says at the beginning of Portal. He says, love doesn't surprise me. Faith doesn't surprise me. Hope. Now, hope surprises me that you can look at the world in the way that it is and you think to yourself, tomorrow will be better. Right. A bit, you know, it's this, it's this really kind of boundless optimism. Um, but it's not an optimism that's not um, aware of how hard it is. Right. So I don't know. I think I think absolutely, Peggy. Um, is is dead on on a lot of this and right? he can see he can see this time it will be different even if you think mm -hmm. according to what evidence right yeah that's wonderful any any final thoughts bobby no. for jennifer i'm just awfully grateful i mean i i i read like just a little bit of french with tra translation but there's just so much just the, so much more i have to i have to just learn french to read piggy and I don't know why, but I felt like there was something to this guy. And the more I learn about him, um, you know, from people like you, Jenny, uh, just really makes me feel grateful that 
um, this whole endeavor, we've decided to kind of put Piggy at the forefront because of his radical radicality, um, his, I mean, genuine authenticity, um, and, you know, primarily for today's world, uh, with the stress on hope. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for, for coming on. It was, it's just great to hear, uh, about the life of Piggy and his, uh, his importance for today. It's been my absolute pleasure. And if it makes you feel better about the French, um, someone once quipped said, oh, I'm going to translate Peggy into English. And they said, oh, it's a pity someone doesn't first translate him into French because uh-huh. it's very nice to French. So I think uh, you're on the ground. But it's been a real pleasure to talk with you both. And I'm grateful for the opportunity um, to have a very edifying conversation. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Our guest has been Jennifer Newsom Martin, who is the new director of the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture and Associate Professor of Theology at Notre Dame. Uh, Please do join us again sometime soon, Jenny. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And for all our listeners, if you've enjoyed this conversation, please do like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, God bless and live in hope.